Thank you for attending this lecture in our Brain Seminar Series. That's Building Research Acumen in Neuropsychology. We hope this series helps researchers and their staff, particularly in low and middle income countries, to enhance their knowledge and skills in conducting research using neuropsychological theories, tools, and measures, as well as lead to important scientific contributions and new collaborations. At a later date, we'll be hosting a live Q&A session for this lecture. We will send out Zoom links with the date and time. If you cannot attend the Q&A, we have set up a Google form for you to submit questions, which will be read and answered during the live session. We will be recording all the Q&A sessions so that those who cannot attend may benefit from them. They'll be posted on our YouTube channel. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ruben Robbins. I'm a clinical psychologist and neuropsychologist and assistant professor of medical clinical psychology at the New York State Psychiatric Institute and Columbia University Irving Medical Center. I'm also an investigator at the HIV Center for Clinical and Behavioral Studies. In this lecture, I'll be discussing the neurocognitive aspects of HIV. The main focus here is on adults with behaviorally acquired HIV. First, I'd like to set some context for this talk by reviewing the current state of the HIV epidemic. Currently, there are around 37 million people living with HIV worldwide, most of whom reside in Sub-Saharan Africa. In 2018, there were an estimated 1.7 million new HIV infections globally. Many, if not most, were also in Sub-Saharan Africa and other low and middle income countries. This poses great challenges for healthcare systems in resource limited settings to treat and care for the tens of millions of people living with HIV. Today, I'll be talking about the immune system, the brain or central nervous system, and HIV infection. Before I get into the neurocognitive aspects of HIV, I just wanna do a brief review of these three important components to today's talk. The immune system is a complex system of biological structures and processes. I'm not gonna get into too much detail about it. I just wanna cover what is relevant to the rest of this talk. The immune system is a defense system with each, within each of us that protects us against disease. The immune system can detect a wide variety of agents known as pathogens, such as viruses and parasitic worms and other disease causing agents. And it can distinguish them from the organism's own healthy cells and tissue. There are cells in the immune system responsible for figuring out what the pathogen is and cells for killing the pathogens. CD4 T cells, often known as helper T cells, are very important in HIV. These are the cells that determine how the immune system needs to respond to a pathogen. Without them, your body cannot figure out what is entering into it, whether it's friendly or dangerous. And without knowing what the pathogen is, or that it's even a pathogen, the immune system does not know how to respond to it. Inflammation is one of the first responses of the immune system to the presence of pathogens. Inflammation is the marshalling of the immune system to figure out what the pathogen is and how to respond to it. It's marshalling all its resources to attack the pathogen. The central nervous system is a specialized set of cells that include the spinal cord and brain. The CNS and brain are responsible for integrating received information, that's conscious information, what you see, hear, smell, taste, and can feel, and very subtle or unconscious information, patterns of light or very subtle tones in the voice or uh, micro uh, facial movements that you don't detect consciously, and coordinates that information which influences the activity of all parts of the bodies, including all involuntary movement, that's like the heartbeat and the lungs, 
as well as voluntary movements, which would be running and walking or taking your keys out of your bag to unlock your door. The CNS is contained within its own environment, separate from the rest of the body. It is encased in cerebrospinal fluid. Generally speaking, there are two kinds of cells in the CNS. Neurons, those are what we might call brain cells, and glial cells. Glial cells are the, CN, the CNS's immune system cells. There are different types like microglia, astrocytes, and macrophages. The blood-brain barrier separates the CNS from the rest of the body. Only select cells can cross the blood-brain barrier. The human immunodeficiency virus is a very sophisticated virus. When infected, HIV hijacks the CD4 T cells. It attaches to the surface of a CD4 cell tricks the cell to letting it release its contents into the CD4 cell. In other words, it gets inside of the CD4 cell. Once inside the CD4 cell, it becomes part of it, becomes part of it and takes over the CD4 cell processes, in effect killing the CD4 cell. It then uses that cell to produce more and more HIV. The CD4 cells, in essence, become HIV replication factories. With more and more virus in the body, more and more CD4 cells are targeted and killed to the point where someone very sick with HIV has very few CD4 cells. That renders the immune system helpless against attack from any other pathogens or diseases. So often when we think about someone very sick with HIV, we talk about them having a compromised immune system any kind of sickness that they normally could fight off could now be uh, a disaster for them, causing greater sickness, uh, if not death. Typically speaking, the more virus you have, or the greater the viral load, the few, fewer CD4 cells you have. Generally speaking, antiretroviral therapy, ART, targets either the virus's ability to attach to the surface of CD4 cells, making it impossible for the virus to attach to the CD4 cell, or it interferes with the hijacking process. That is, once the virus gets in the CD4 cell, ART makes it too difficult for the HIV to properly uh, reproduce or replicate. Unlike many other viruses, HIV is able to cross the blood-brain barrier. That's the barrier that separates the central nervous system and brain from the rest of the body. In fact, HIV is thought to have an affinity for this central nervous system. Early during infection, the virus makes its way to the CNS. Once in the CNS, HIV has direct and indirect effects there. HIV can directly affect the CNS's immune cells like the microglia, macrophages, and astrocytes. Just like in the rest of the body, where HIV hijacks the CD4 cells, the body's immune cells, and takes them over and begins its replication process there, destroying the CD4 cell and becoming a carrier of HIV, HIV can do that with the same immune cells in the central nervous system. Infected immune cells then release inflammatory cytokines and chemokines. That actually can attract more immune cells from outside the central nervous system, which may also be carriers of HIV. While HIV does not directly attack neurons, although there may be some debate about that, inflammatory responses can damage them. Inflammation refers to swelling. For example, when you have a cold, often the lymph nodes in your neck area, down around here, are swollen, that's an inflammatory res response or process. Your cells are fighting off an invader. Viral proteins that the infected immune cells release are also thought to damage neurons and other brain structures. The brain regions most likely to be affected by this process are the basal ganglia, prefrontal cortex, hippocampus, and the white matter. The basal ganglia is a subcortical structure. 
It's not visible from looking at the surface of the brain. It is involved in regulating attentional processes, learning, and voluntary motor control, among other things. The prefrontal cortex, roughly where the red highlighting is, is involved in higher order processes like executive functions, which involve planning, organizing, problem solving, and response inhibition or response control. The hippocampus, the light blue area there, is a subcortical structure located in the temporal lobe, which is highlighted in green. The hippocampus is involved in the formation of factual memory, generally speaking. The white matter tracks are the connections between all the neurons, the routes of communication between the different parts. In HIV, specific structures are damaged, as well as the connections or communication routes between structures. Well, you may be wondering, how does that impact our neurocognitive functioning? These inflammatory processes and indirect and direct damage to our CNS's immune cells, as well as to the neurons, cause neurocognitive impairment. We rely on our brains for all activities in life. When there is damage there, that damage often affects our neurocognitive processes, often referred to as cognitive processes as well. Generally speaking, we can refer to that as thinking. But as we'll see shortly, there are a variety of important functions that are affected. As a side note, there's a lecture by Dr. Hauser that describes cognitive processes in more detail. Neurocognitive impairment in HIV is very common. As many as 50% of people living with HIV are affected by it. It is the most feared symptom among people living with HIV. The caveat here is that many places in the world with a high burden of HIV might have a lack of knowledge about what neurocognitive problems are and how HIV can cause them. So in those places, neurocognitive impairment may not be feared because it's not really understood. Neurocognitive impairment in HIV can fluctuate. This is unlike neurodegenerative diseases, such as Alzheimer's, where the symptoms get worse and worse over time. If you recall a few slides back about how it is the inflammation of the immune cells in the brain that cause most of the problems, as the inflammation subsides, so can the effects. If a patient is diagnosed with HIV late and has a very high viral load and very low CD4 count, meaning they are very sick, they may show more neurocognitive impairment. Hence, when they get on ART or antiretroviral therapy and their viral load goes down and their CD4 cell count goes up and the inflammation in the brain goes down, some of their neurocognitive problems may also get better. However, it is unlikely that their neurocognitive functioning would completely return to where it was before becoming infected. The sicker one is at diagnosis, and when they start treatment, the more damage can be done, making it harder to fully regain all their neurocognitive capacity, though they likely will see some improvements. The typical complaints by patients are mild memory problems, for example, forgetting where you put things, forgetting appointments you've made, slowed thinking, concentration problems, that's not being able to focus on a task for a sustained period of time, planning difficulties, and multitasking difficulties. Neurocognitive impairment in HIV is associated with increased risk for mortality, poor antiretroviral therapy adherence, impaired activities of daily living, that's getting dressed, going grocery shopping, uh, managing your finances, perhaps driving a car, and employment difficulties, as well as poor decision-making. The neurocognitive domains most likely to be impaired in, early in the course of HIV infection are attention, concentration, working memory, executive functioning, speed of information processing, and motor functioning. The domains most likely to be impaired later in the course of the disease or even in untreated HIV are learning, memory, physiospatial ability, and motor functioning. 
a side note on the neurocognitive domains I'm listing here, Dr. Howes's lecture goes into more detail. Very briefly, attention, concentration refers to our ability to concentrate on tasks for a sustained period of time without uh, succumbing to distraction. Working memory refers to our ability to maintain and manipulate small pieces of information over a short period of time. For example, uh, remembering uh, a phone number that someone just gives you from uh, them telling you to you writing it down a minute later. Learning refers to learning new information. Often that's referred to as encoding that information. Memory or retrieval refers to finding that information in memory storage and retrieving it for use at a later time. Physiospatial ability refers to our ability to uh, understand where we are in space and navigational abilities. Executive functioning, I talked momentarily about a little while ago. Uh, planning, organization, response inhibition. Speed of information is how fast you can process or think through things. And motor functioning refers to more fine motor abilities. In terms of describing the neurocognitive symptoms from HIV infection, a research classification system or nosology has been developed. Known as the Frascati criteria, these symptoms are classified under HIV-associated neurocognitive disorder, also known as HAND. These are as follows. Asymptomatic neurocognitive impairment, mild neurocognitive disorder, HIV-associated dementia. Here I've listed them in order of severity. The hand categories share symptom overlap with the DSM-5 neurocognitive disorders due to HIV infection and the ICD-10 cognitive impairment due to HIV infection. There's overlap, but they're not exactly the same. It's important to note that hand is a research-based criteria. So in more detail, hand categories follow these guidelines. For asymptomatic neurocognitive disorder, we need to see neurocognitive impairment in two or more of those neurocognitive domains with no functional impairment. Now, impairment here is defined as one standard deviation below the mean in two domains. Mild neurocognitive disorder follows the same general neurocognitive testing criteria as A and I with functional impairment. So we have neurocognitive impairment in two or more domains with functional impairment. This can be patient reported and or collateral or caregiver uh, significant other reported. Again, it's one standard deviation below the mean in two domains. HIV associated dementia, which is the most severe form of hand, is highlighted by marked neurocognitive impairment with marked functional impairment. Here, we have two standard deviations below the mean in two domains with significant functional impairment. In a somewhat recent study uh, done here in the US, uh, a multi-site center study known as the Charter Study, which had over 1,500 HIV infected adults, they found that 52% had some kind of neurocognitive impairment. 33% was ANI or asymptomatic neurocognitive impairment, 12% was mild neurocognitive disorder, and 2% was HIV-associated dementia. In this study, they did a very nice job of controlling for other factors that could be causing neurocognitive problems, such as uh, traumatic brain injuries, uh, people who had been in comas, and a variety of other comorbidities that could impact neurocognitive functioning. So this is, generally speaking, one of the most well-characterized uh, studies of hand. It's also important to note that early in the HIV epidemic in the 80s and 90s, HIV-associated dementia was much more common in the upwards of 10% uh, prevalence rate. After the advent of highly active antiretroviral therapies or combined ART, that rate significantly uh, reduced. Now we see much lower rates of HIV-associated dementia, and it's really connected to uh, people who are very sick with HIV, very low CD4 counts and very high viral load. 
The typical features of HIV-associated dementia are mental slowness, loss of mental stamina, memory problems, and these are severe. Again, this would be two standard deviations below the mean if you use the Frascati criteria, poor concentration of comprehension. That's the neurocognitive side. Behaviorally, we can see apathy, lethargy, diminished emotional response, reduced gregariousness, depression, agitation. From the motor side, here we'll see unsteady gait, which we don't measure for hand. This would, that unsteady gait comes from a neurological exam. Poor balance, incoordination, abnormal tone, and tremors. This is referring to general motor uh, as opposed to fine motor functioning, as which we would assess uh, in a neurocognitive assessment, which we'll get to in a, in a minute or two. There are a variety of risk factors for developing hand. Low Nader CD4, so this refers to the lowest CD4 count you ever had. Here, that becomes a reflection of the level of sickness you had upon diagnosis. If you come in to treatment or you get diagnosed with HIV uh, later on and you're very sick, then you're much more likely to have some kind of neurocognitive problem. Poor art adherence uh, is, puts you at risk because if you don't take your medications as prescribed, you will not be controlling the virus as well as you could be. So with more virus, there's more replication, and there's more chance that it can get into the CNS and uh, cause problems there. Now we also see people with older age have a higher uh, risk for developing uh, hand symptoms. Uh, here, uh, aging is associated with normal cognitive declines, but there may be some exacerbation of those normal declines among people with HIV. A short duration of ART also can put you at risk for hand again. That may have more to do with how well controlled your HIV is. If, it's, if you don't have undetectable or less than detectable viral load, uh, there's a higher chance that HIV is uh, in the central nervous system. And also the presence of other cerebrovascular disease factors such as um, uh, heart disease, uh, also put you at risk for uh, having hand. How do we go about detecting hand or neurocognitive impairment among people living with HIV? First, it's important to note that it can be challenging to do so because many patients are, have asymptomatic neurocognitive problems or very mild symptoms. So they may not be volunteering symptoms because they're not really aware of them. Physicians caring for patients may not have the relevant training for diagnosis and management of hand, and they may not be trained in using screening tools or uh, neurocognitive assessments on how to measure functional cognitive capacity. A side note here, Dr. Hauser also has a recently published paper uh, on uh, HIV care providers in South Africa, their knowledge, training, uh, and uh, screening practices of hand. Uh, and, and she showed there that uh, there's some general knowledge of hand, but very few uh, practitioners are screening for hand on a regular basis. There are also practical difficulties with routine screening for hand in busy clinic settings. Often there aren't personnel to, who are trained to uh, use uh, neurocognitive screening tests. Uh, and uh, or there's just not access to a neuropsychologist uh, or psychologist who could do that. And there may be a lack of knowledge. Uh, and there are no formal guidelines anywhere about what that screening process should look like. And as I mentioned, there's often limited access to formal neuropsychological testing. That's not just in the case in low to middle income countries, but also here in the United States. The gold standard method to uh, measure and detect neurocognitive impairment in HIV is a neuropsychological evaluation, and I'll make, say a comprehensive neuropsychological evaluation. It's a functional assessment of all those neurocognitive domains that I talked about several slides back. It has uh, a battery of multiple tests, usually more than one test per domain. It involves standardized tests of ability that assesses functional capacity. And individual performance on these tests is compared to 
control performance or norms. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go on. And in fact, uh, Dr. Kevin Thomas has a lecture on cross-cultural neuropsychology, uh, which talks more about the issues of norms. Now, there are challenges with the gold standard evaluation, as it requires a neuropsychologist, or at the very least, a psychometrist or technician who's trained in how to administer the tests. These batteries or evaluations can last upwards of two to four hours, some even longer. And then more time is needed to score and interpret them. Here, I just list some common tests used in HIV research uh, batteries. Um, but this is not exclusive and other uh, people use different tests and different research groups use a different battery of tests. But these are some common ones that have been used in HIV um, for many years. The Hopkins Verbal Learning Test revised, the Brief Physiospatial Memory Test revised, uh, WASTE, the, that's the Wexler Intelligence Scales, various subtests like digit span or symbol search. Um, or digit symbol coding, the Wisconsin card sorting test, and group pegboard. So here we would have the HVLT is verbal memory, the VVMT is uh, visuospatial memory or visual or nonverbal memory. A WACE subtests uh, would range digit span as working memory, uh, symbol search and digit symbol coding would be processing speed. Wisconsin card sorting test would be an executive functioning test and groove pegboard would be a fine motor functioning test. Here's a picture of them. Uh, here's my mouse. So this is groove pegboard. You can see somebody has to pick up those pegs, um, which have a little groove, and the board has little grooves that are at different angles, and you have to put them in the board as quickly as you can. Uh, so that's a sort of mo the kind of motor test we would have in a neuropsychological evaluation. And this just highlights that there's usually a variety of forms, uh, equipment, and stopwatches that are needed to conduct a neuropsychological evaluation. Now, this is particularly challenging if, for resource-limited settings, and that is very time-consuming. In some places around the world, uh, in many low- to middle-income countries, the patient-to-physician ratio is very small. Uh, and uh, the patient to psychologist ratio is even smaller. So there often just are not uh, any trained personnel available to conduct assessments. Uh, similarly, many clinics around the world are burdened with uh, treating HIV patients and they don't have the time to do neurocognitive assessments. Often around the world we have uh, do not have uh, appropriate norms for different populations. It's a real challenge. Well, if you take the norms from the United States and use those norms for people in South Africa, people may look much more impaired than they are because they're not performing like the folks in the US. But in fact, it may not reflect any kind of neurocognitive impairment. And to do a gold standard neuropsychological uh, evaluation is just not feasible or scalable for the 37 million people living with HIV. Screening tests are an option that require less time, equipment, and forms. So you still need someone who's trained in how to administer, score, and interpret them. Some of the commonly used screening tests in HIV, I'm not specifically recommending any of these, I'm just pointing them out, would be the mini mental status exam, which is used in other uh, areas as well, particularly Alzheimer's. The Montreal Cognitive Assessment, the HIV Dementia Scale, and the International HIV Dementia Scale. Screening tests are not without their own shortcomings. One, they're not definitive, meaning the idea behind the screening test is to find those people who are most likely to have bona fide neurocognitive problems. You still usually need a confirmatory test or assessment. Many of the screening tests that do exist have in HIV or used in HIV have poor sensitivity and specificity to detect mild form, milder forms of HIV-associated neurocognitive impairment, which is problematic as the most common form 
of neurocognitive impairment in HIV is mild. Some items on the screening test may not be appropriate for some populations. In some research we did a few years back uh, in South Africa with the Montreal Cognitive Assessment, we showed that both HIV positive and HIV negative people had a very difficult time drawing the cube. We don't think that had anything to do with neurocognitive problems per se. Rather, most of these participants had never learned or had the opportunity to draw a 3D cube. Many of these screening tests do not have norms that reflect local populations. In the study I just mentioned, we found that the HIV negative group, which was about 30 years of age, performed more similarly to the published norms on the MOCA of North Americans greater than 70 years old with an Alzheimer's diagnosis. Finally, some screening tests may not be appropriate for use by the full range of the healthcare workforce. Some research has shown that community health workers or lay counselors, which are commonly used in low and middle income countries or resource limited settings, tend to over detect cognitive problems at a much higher rate than uh, nurses and physicians. Now it's important to also talk about how we differentiate uh, HIV associated neurocognitive impairment from other causes of neurocognitive impairment. And one of the most common questions I often get is how does HIV associated dementia differ from Alzheimer's disease? So generally what I tell people is that early HIV associated dementia differs from Alzheimer's disease in that it is more likely to present with behavioral changes, progresses more rapidly, is rarely associated with aphasia or word finding difficulties, and tends to be associated with abnormal CSF findings. That's uh, cerebrospinal fluid findings. So that's the um, fluid that runs through the central nervous system. And we can uh, often find uh, HIV in the CSF uh, among ha patients who have HIV associated dementia. And Alzheimer's is, again, a progressive disease that progresses slowly. So HIV-associated dementia is really tied to the physical health of the person and how the virus is replicating and reproducing in the body. So very sick people tend to have lots of virus and very low CD4 counts. Once that changes, and that can happen quickly over the course of weeks or months uh, versus the neurodegenerative process of Alzheimer's disease, which typically take years. There are a variety of other comorbidities that can also have neurocognitive effects. Co-infections that are common with HIV, like hepatitis B and C, toxoplasma, cytomegalovirus, cryptococcus, tuberculosis, malaria, meningitis, they all can have their own neurocognitive effects. Medications can also have effects on the brain. Uh, for example, uh, psychotropic medications uh, for psychiatric conditions uh, can slow thinking processes down. Um, and antiretroviral therapy uh, could also have some adverse effects. For example, efavirenz have been known to cause uh, very vivid dreams and some other uh, mild uh, effects. Aging uh, has its own neurocognitive effects. We typically see a cognitive decline that's normal in aging populations. As we all know, the older you get, the worse your memory becomes, but that's normal. And then substance use issues, alcohol, very severe alcohol use and abuse. Uh, for example, Korsakoff syndrome, uh, uh, which is often associated with very severe liver disease, uh, has a lot of neurocognitive problems. Other comorbidities uh, include psychiatric disorders, and I'm going to talk more about that, in particular mood and anxiety disorders, systemic metabolic disorders, issues of anemia and diabetes also can have cognitive effects, and they can be common in, in HIV populations, and then other neurodegenerative disorders like Parkinson's uh, and Alzheimer's. Here I'll highlight a few of these comorbidities that tend to be very common in people living with HIV. Hepatitis C is known to cause neurocognitive impairment on its own. 
It can exacerbate the neurocognitive deficits associated with HIV. Hepatitis C is neurotropic in that it can cause brain cells to die. It also replicates in the central nervous system. It may upregulate HIV replication. So if there's more virus, more HIV in your system, you're more likely to have neurocognitive problems. And there are additive effects where hepatitis C plus HIV plus crystal meth use lead to greater and greater neurocognitive impairment. Crystal meth use, or TIC, as I believe it's called in South Africa, are very common among uh, people living with, crystal meth use is very common among people living with HIV, at least here in the US. Chronic liver disease, which is a symptom or consequence of hepatitis C, even without cirrhosis, is associated with cognitive deficits. Psychiatric and mental health considerations are very important. They're very common among people living with HIV. In a somewhat old study now that was conducted with almost 3,000 people living with HIV, and that's highly cited, showed that 48% of people living with HIV had some current psychiatric disorder. Most of those people had major depressive disorder, uh, rounded out by dysthymia, general anxiety disorder, panic attack, drug dependence, and problematic alcohol use. The point here is that depression really is very common among people living with HIV. And that's really important to take into consideration when we're trying to uh, assess or conduct research on hand. That's because depression in HIV can look a lot like neurocognitive problems. For example, the physical symptoms of depression, that's the weight loss and the low energy, are also symptoms of having HIV. Psychomotor retardation or apathy that's seen in HIV dementia may be confused for depression. Depressive symptoms can also be the first sign of mild neurocognitive disorder. And having depression can interfere with attention and concentration, which can be confused for memory problems. If you think about somebody who's depressed, or maybe you've had an experience like that, or it's not depression per se, but you get very down or sad, and you begin to ruminate on something. Perhaps you, if you had a recent breakup with a loved one, you may be focused on thinking about what happened, why did it happen, uh, how terrible it feels, and you go out to a movie with some friends or watch a movie with some friends, and afterwards everyone's talking about what you just watched, and you can't remember any of it. Uh, that's because you were thinking about your loved one and what was going on there. So that's an attention concentration issue, not a memory problem. You weren't, didn't encode any new information because you weren't paying attention. But because you can't remember the details of the movie doesn't mean you have a memory problem. Anxiety in HIV is also common. The symptoms can range from normal anxiety, where you're just anxious about getting an HIV test, uh, to more uh, pronounced anxiety uh, after you receive an HIV or AIDS diagnosis, to pronounced and pervasive symptoms, which would be an anxiety disorder. The rates of anxiety disorders tend to increase as illness progresses, and the co-occurrence of anxiety with depression is high. Now, anxiety can also interfere with attention and concentration. If you think about someone who's very anxious, they're worried about something or some things going on. And instead of paying attention to uh, what's in front of them, their thinking is focused on the worry. And they may not encode new information. So similarly, the very worried person, when they watch that movie, uh, they're not paying attention to the movie. They're thinking about what they need to be worried about or get prepared for. And when the movie's over, they can't remember any details from the movie or very few. Now, that's not a memory problem. That's an attention and concentration issue where the anxiety was interfering with those abilities. Aging with HIV is a very important topic to take into consideration, particularly because uh, people living with HIV are living much longer normal lifespans. They're growing older uh, with relative health and leading some, for the most part, normal lives when they uh, take their medications. That introduces a whole host of 
important issues to consider. So in older adults, there's a greater incidence of cardiovascular, cerebrovascular, and metabolic morbidities or comorbidities uh, like diabetes, uh, high cholesterol, hypertension, issues like that. Uh, the side effects uh, of medications to treat those illnesses can cause neurocognitive issues. Those morbidities can also cause neurocognitive problems, and they're also higher among normal aging populations. And there could be some uh, additive effects in HIV populations. We are, you're more likely to have more cardiovascular problems as you get older, and HIV people may have that on top of their HIV. Now, some studies have found that uh, older age among people living with HIV shows an increased risk for having HIV-associated dementia, and that acquiring HIV at an older age in life has been associated with a greater progression to AIDS, meaning there's more sickness and then more likely to have neurocognitive problems. Now, why does HAND continue uh, in our era of um, highly effective antiretroviral therapies? So there are comorbid background factors that may limit the potential of ART to improve HAND. There's the legacy effect hypothesis, and that uh, refers to how HIV replication in the CNS uh, can produce non-reversible neuronal damage especially in those with acute CD4 cell depletion. So if when you were diagnosed with HIV and started treatment, you were very sick, had very low CD4 cells, perhaps very high uh, HIV replication, there was damage done to your central nervous system that cannot fully be recovered. So the sicker you are, the lower you go, the harder it is to get back to where you were. You may uh, regain some uh, capacity, but not all of it. So another hypothesis is that there's active HIV replication in the CNS, may not even be detectable in regular viral load testing. And uh, research has shown that improved cognition has been seen more frequently in patients with suppressed HIV in the cerebrospinal fluid compared to those without. And that's independent of HIV status in the blood plasma. There's also um, hypotheses that there's limit, the limited ability of our uh, antiretroviral therapies to target central nervous system cells. The medications cannot suppress, suppress the production of neurotoxic viral proteins. For example, TAT. These are uh, proteins that come out of the process of HIV reproduction or replication that cause um, brain cells to be um, killed. There's also some thought and concern that ART may in fact have some uh, subtle uh, neurotoxic effects. Uh, and what we don't fully understand is among many people on ART, they're on ART for their duration of their life, and some people have been on ART for uh, several decades now. Uh, so there's some important research that needs to be done there as well as to understand the long-term uh, neurotoxic effects or possible neurotoxic effects of ART. Now, what about treatment for uh, neurocognitive problems in HIV? So to date, there's no medications, no uh, pharmacotherapies or medications to treat HAND. Um, there uh, have been a number of clinical trials to identify uh, medications to treat HAND, and none to date have yielded uh, uh, clinically significant uh, results to suggest we have a medical treatment. Cognitive remediation uh, is a more behavioral type of uh, treatment. And uh, typically speaking, it's uh, categorized into two forms of cognitive remediation. There's compensatory and restorative. Compensatory typically consists of group or individual training that provides compensatory skills or strategies to manage impairment via learned cognitive skills and environmental planning. So here, you're learning skills to compensate for the deficits you have. Restorative uh, approaches uh, target impairments through repeated and increasingly complex task practice via computers. And the idea here is that through these repeated uh, tasks on the computer, you're restoring the brain's functions. 
And some research uh, has been shown in uh, uh, with HIV populations here in the US uh, that the restorative approach shows uh, some promising results. And I believe there's been a few other smaller studies in uh, low and middle income countries like Uganda among uh, youth with HIV that may show that cognitive remediation shows some promising results to uh, treat the symptoms of hand. So currently we don't have much to offer most people aside from uh, encouraging them to take their medications, their ART. Uh, we can provide psychoeducation about the um, clinical impact of hand uh, on their everyday lives, which can lead to uh, environmental engine engineering strategies uh, and supportive therapy. We can encourage people to set reminders, uh, uh, seek support from their loved ones, loved ones or uh, caregivers to uh, set reminders, uh, help them uh, put together nice calendars to stay organized and keep on top of appointments and things like that. Uh, there's also been uh, some research that's looked at the CNS penetration of antiretroviral therapies. So that research is mixed. Uh, some research has found uh, no effect in cognitive functioning. So there's been a CNS penetration ranking system uh, that was developed uh, by a, a researcher at the University of California in San Diego, which I'm not showing here, where they rank how well different uh, ART medications penetrate the central nervous system. So among those that uh, showed the highest penetration, uh, the research on those medications is very mixed, from no effect to uh, some effect only among those with cognitive impairment, uh, to greater improvement in art naive versus art experienced uh, uh, patients, um, to uh, actual worse neurocognitive performance among the more penetrant drugs, although they did show lower um, amounts of HIV in the cerebrospinal fluid, uh, to no evidence at all that it benefits. So to summarize, Neurocognitive impairment is very common among people living with HIV. This impairment negatively, negatively affects activities of daily living, art adherence, employment, decision making, uh, speed of information processing, attention, working memory, motor skills or motor functioning are the most common domains affected. Uh, a comprehensive neuropsychological evaluation or assessment is the gold standard to detect and diagnose neurocognitive impairment. Screening tests for impairment are faster, but not definitive. Uh, some settings lack skilled personnel to administer uh, tests, uh, as well as lack norms for test results. There are numerous comorbidities that could also affect the brain and neurocognitive functioning. There's no medications available to treat uh, hand specifically, but there are promising studies indicating that cognitive remediation can help. With approximately 37 million people living with HIV worldwide, that potentially translates to as many as 18 and a half million people with neurocognitive impairment. Now we think about in the, that in the context of HIV, uh, that really could lead to many people having poor adherence because of uh, their uh, cognitive impairments interfering with their capacity to take their medications. It also could lead to a lot of people um, making poor decisions about uh, sec uh, sexual risk-taking behaviors, like condomless sex. So if we have poor adherence and people not engaging in uh, safe sex practices, uh, we may see a lot of people who have uh, high viral loads uh, and not using condoms, which could lead to high HIV transmission risk. So in theory, we could see a picture of uh, poor health outcomes and also high HIV transmission risk. And we think about where we are in the HIV epidemic, there's a great push to end the epidemic or achieve uh, 90, 90, 90 goals. Neurocognitive impairment could really uh, interfere with achieving those goals. So with greater access to antiretroviral therapy, people with HIV are living much longer lives. And it might be the case that rates of Alzheimer's disease and related dementias are higher in people living with HIV. Uh, and that might be 
due to premature and or accelerated aging effects of HIV. So this is an interesting new area of research among older people living with HIV to understand if uh, having HIV uh, puts you at a higher risk for developing Alzheimer's due to premature or accelerated aging. And uh, finally, uh, there's a great need to assess and detect neurocognitive impairment in HIV. And it is really uh, complicated and difficult and challenging to do so in low and middle income countries where there are very few neuropsychological tests exists. There are few personnel available who are trained to administer, score, and interpret those tests. Uh, and there aren't norms, uh, well-characterized norms for those tests in those settings. So there's a lot of work to be done uh, in many settings to really uh, help people living with HIV uh, treat hand and uh, help people live healthy uh, long lives. So thank you very much for attending uh, this lecture today. Again, um, there'll be a live uh, Q&A session at a later date. We'll send out the Zoom link for that. And if you can't make that session, uh, there should be a Google Form link here on the YouTube channel that you can click on and fill out uh, and uh, to ask some questions, which will be asked and answered during the Q&A session. Thank you.